my name is Naomi Storch, I'm from the University of Melbourne, and the paper that I'd like to talk about is entitled Pairing Learners in Pair Work Activity. Uh, it's going to be published in Language Teaching Research in the January 2013 issue. The paper reports on a study that was conducted by one of my PhD students, Ali al Basari, in a male-only college in Saudi Arabia, and looked at the optimal way of pairing learners for pair work activity. Um, the rationale for the study was that when we looked at what happens in English as a foreign language EFL classes in Saudi Arabia, fairly typically they were very much teacher dominated, where um, learners' contributions were fairly minimal. That is, they occurred in response to the teacher's elicitation, and they were often of one word, one word utterances. We have research that show that if we want to uh, encourage learners' participation and contribution and practice in using the second language, we need to get them to work in pairs or small groups on a range of tasks. That what is the best way of pairing students, um, we have very little research about that to date. Because in any one second language class, we're going to have students who are higher and lower proficiency than each other. And we don't know what's the best or the optimal way of pairing such students, whether it's best to pair students of low proficiency with fellow low proficiency or with a higher proficiency learners. Early research um, on proficiency as a factor which affects interaction, informed by the interaction hypothesis, by Mike Long's interaction hypothesis, suggested that it is best to have mixed proficiency pairing because in such pairing, learners are more likely to negotiate because they have more to negotiate about. However, a study by Powell and Swain in 1994 um, showed, and that was conducted in the French immersion program with adolescent students of um, uh, second language, suggested that when we have very large gaps between the learners in terms of proficiency, the lower proficiency learners uh, tend to be intimidated by the higher proficiency learners and contribute very little to the interaction. The first systematic study of the impact of proficiency on interaction, of pair interaction, was by Lisa in 2004. Lisa had adult learners of Spanish as a second language uh, complete a dictogloss task. A dictogloss is a task where learners listen to a, a short passage, take notes, and then based on their notes, reconstruct the text. So Lisa had um, three cohorts of students, one cohort composed of high-high proficiency learners, one composed of high-low proficiency, and the third composed of low-low proficiency learners. We should note that these terms, high and low, are relative terms, they're not absolute. This is learners that were higher and lower proficiency than each other. And Lisa looked in term, uh, investigated how many language-related episodes were generated by these different cohorts. A language-related episode is an episode where the learners focus explicitly on language, be it vocabulary or grammar or mechanics like punctuation. And this is based on the work of Swain uh, and Swain and Lepkin, who have identified and used these episodes in their research. Lisa looked at how many of these LREs were generated in each cohort, as I said before, and also what proportion of these LREs were resolved correctly, incorrectly, and left unresolved. And what he found was that the highest number of LREs were generated by the high-high proficiency learners, and then in descending order by high-low and low-low learners. Similarly, the highest proportion of LREs were um, correctly resolved by the high-high pairs and then high-low and low-low pairs. So based on these findings, Lisa concludes that for low proficiency learners, it is best to pair them with a high proficiency learner because then they get exposure to more LREs and they're more likely to resolve these LREs correctly. Other Sari's PhD said, in a sense, built on Lisa's study, but it was different in a number of different respects. First of all, it used a different task. It used a composition task rather than a dictogloss task. A dictogloss task has been shown to be quite difficult, especially for low proficiency learners. So we used a composition where the learners had to write about in pairs, had to write about factors affecting health in Saudi Arabia. Secondly, uh, we looked not only at language-related episodes, but also at the amount of the second language that the learners used 
when they're working in pairs. Um, as I said before, um, when they're in a regular class, they don't get to use very much the second language. So we wanted to see whether proficiency pairing had an impact on the amount of the second language they use. And thirdly, we looked at the relationship that learners formed when they worked in pairs. In my own earlier study, uh, published in 2002 and 2009, I found that when we get learners to work in pairs, they form very distinct relationships. And these relationships are important um, not only in um, how many language rate episodes they generate, but also in terms of language learning. Using uh, to continue their level of contribution, or equality of contribution, and their mutuality, that is, how much they engage with each other, I propose a model of deity relation, uh, interaction. And I identified four distinct patterns. Uh, one pattern is a collaborative pattern, where both learners contribute equally to, to the task, but also engage with each other's contributions. The second pattern I term dominant dominant or cooperative. Basically, the two learners contribute to the task, but they don't necessarily engage with each other's contribution, or they reject each other's contribution outright. A dominant passive pa pattern is one where one learner takes control of the task and dominates the interaction. The second participant, the so-called passive, contributes very little to the interaction. And the fourth pattern is uh, expert novice, where again we have one learner who dominates the interaction, but unlike the dominant passive pattern, the um, learner, the so-called expert, tries to um, encourage the less active participant, the so-called passive or novice in this case participant, to contribute. It's a bit like a tutor tutee situation. Research by Watanabe and Swain, for example, in 2007, showed that when we have learners of different proficiency, it's not just a proficiency pairing that may impact on how many language-related episodes they generate, but the kind of relationship they form. Uh, and also, Watanabe and Swain, again, found that it's the relationship that is formed which is more important in terms of how much language they learned as a result of the interaction. So in our Dasari study, we had um, learners in Saudi Arabia. Uh, these were EFL learners. And of the 60 participants um, who volunteered to participate, we selected only those that were uh, deemed by the instructor to be high proficiency and low proficiency, um, so that we have a gap between the two proficiency levels. And so we had three cohorts of students, one group made up of high-high pairs, one group of high-low pairs, and one group made up of low-low pairs. And we had six pairs in each of these uh, cohorts. Um, but because of technical difficulties, we end up with five pairs. So they worked on this composition task, and we recorded their interaction. Um, and then the transcribed interactions were coded firstly for language-related episodes, um, looking at um, what is the focus of the episode, whether they're focusing on vocabulary or grammar or mechanics, and the nature of the resolution. And in the article, we have examples of these language-related episodes and how they were coded. We also coded the amount of the second language they used, and we distinguished between, um, and we coded for um, what proportion of the talk was in the second language, that is, out of the total amount of words used or proportion was in a second language. And we also looked at how many of the turns that they uh, had were predominantly or wholly in the second language as a proportion, again, of the total number of turns. And that gave us an indication of how much of the second language they used. So we looked, as I said, focus on language, LREs, and amount of second language used. We also coded for the relationship that they formed, and we found three types of relationship. Uh, we found collaborative relationships, we found expert-novice relationships, and we found dominant-passive relationships. So in reporting the findings, um, we reported in terms of, first of all, proficiency pairing, what impact proficiency pairing had on LREs and amount of second language uh, generated. And then what impact the pattern that they formed had on the LREs and the amount of the second language that they produced. 
In terms of the proficiency pairing, our findings are very similar to Lisa. That is, we found that the largest number of language-related episodes were generated by pairs composed of high-high learners, and then in descending order, high-low and low-low. Most of these LREs focused on Lexus, not surprising because it was a very much a meaning-focused task. Um, in terms of resolution, there were no differences between the proportion of LREs that were resolved correctly between the three cohorts. Over 70% of the LREs were uh, resolved correctly, and there were just marginally more uh, uh, LREs corrected correctly resolved in the high-high pairs compared to the high-low and low-low pairs. So in terms of LRE and resolution, um, number of LREs are finding the similar to Lisa, high-high pairs generate the highest number, high-low, second highest, and low-low, the least number of LREs. Um, in terms of amount of L2 produced, uh, we found that most of the pairs generated um, used the second language to a large extent. Um, most of their utterances were in the second language, regardless of proficiency pairing. And this is probably because they saw this activity as an opportunity to use the second language. So proficiency pairing had an impact on the number of LREs, did not seem to have an impact on the resolution of the LREs, uh, or on focus of the LREs, and did not have an impact on the amount of L2 used. This is in terms of cohorts. So on the basis of these findings, we could say, uh, similar to Lisa, that it is best to pair a low proficiency learner with a high proficiency learner. However, the range of the LREs produced was quite different. The range was quite high, which suggested differences between pairs. And this became clearer when we looked at the patterns of interaction that their the learners form. We found that when they worked in similar proficiency pairing, that is in the high-high and low-low pairs, most of them worked collaboratively. That is, they both engaged, they both contributed to the task and engaged with each other's contribution. In two pairs of the high-high learners, there was also an expert novice relationship. But this is still conducive to learning. In pairs composed of high-low learners, what we found was that out of the five, only one pair collaborated. Two of the pairs formed what we call dominant-passive relationship. Basically, one learner dominating the interaction, the low-proficiency learner in both cases, contributing very little to the task. There were very few LREs generated, only two LREs in the case of one pair generated by pairs forming uh, dominant-passive relationships. Um, and Moreover, when we looked at the length of turns, even though they, they used uh, second language quite a lot in their interaction, when we looked at the length of turns, we found that in the case of high-high and low-low learners, the length of the L2 turn averaged about five words per turn. In the case of learners who formed the dominant passive relationship, the dominant participants' turns were about 10 words per turn, the passive participants' uh, turns were about three words per turn. So they um, did not contribute very much. And when they contributed, they, their utterances were fairly short, almost similar to the teacher-led uh, class. So on the basis of relationship they form, it seemed that low-proficiency learners are, in a sense, disadvantaged by being paired with a high-proficiency learner because they don't engage, they don't contribute very much to the interaction, there are very few LREs generated, and they don't, use, they don't practice using the second language very much. So if we wanted to um, conclude about what is the optimal way of pairing students, it seems to us it really depends on the aim of the activity. If the aim of the activity is to focus on language, then it is best to pair a low-proficiency learner with a high-proficiency learner because then they tend to be exposed to more LREs, particularly if they collaborate or if they form an expert-novice relationship. But if the aim of the activity is to get them to use the second language, to practice using the second language for a range of functions, 
then it is best to pair a low proficiency learner with a fellow low proficiency learner because then they get a chance, they tend to collaborate, and they get a chance to practice using the second language much more than if they're paired with a high proficiency learner. So we do recommend using pair work in language classes, but we also recommend that the teachers keep the aim of the activity in mind and monitors the kind of relationship that learners form when they're working in pair because these are very significant. I hope you find the research useful and um, I thank you for the opportunity to talk about this research in this presentation. Thank you.